Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mihai Pohonsu. I'm the CEO of Amber, and I would like to talk to you today about uh, external development. You know, our experience uh, in the industry pursuing external development, in other words, our war stories, and what we learned from this experience. Um, hopefully, you'll find this informative and you'll be able to apply it to your own uh, products and projects. Um, a few words about me uh, and why I can speak with some level of confidence uh, and competence about external development. I start my career uh, at Activision, but truly the first experience with the external development came at Jam.Mobile, where I managed uh, teams in uh, three locations um, for our uh, QA and support groups. Um, but truly, um, a large part of my knowledge of the area came from EA, when I, where I managed the central development services team uh, starting with 2006. And in that uh, capacity, I've managed teams across 14 different locations around the world. Um, and continuing on to uh, Disney, it was my first experience managing external studios. So we established um, an external development a uh, support organization that produced games using indie studios around the world. Um, learned quite a bit from that experience. And then onwards to Samsung and finally at Amber. Amber is a game development agency. Um, we are an uh, external development partner to many studios and publishers. We have offices around the world, uh, headquartered in Bucharest, but also a large operation in Guadalajara and a presence in uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco as well. And um, there will be roughly three sections to my presentation. In the first section, I would like to define what external development means in the game space. Um, and then uh, we can look at some case studies, what I called war stories, and then kind of summarizing the key takeaways that I think would be important to retain in order to have uh, successful engagements in this format. Um, full development is um, probably the most uh, widely encountered form of external development. It means that, you know, as a publisher or a studio, you're relying on uh, an external partner, another studio most often, to create a game. And um, uh, this is uh, largely an effort undertaken by a single developer, but it could be a combination of uh, several teams. Um, and, um, you know, these teams are, may be handling particular components of the game, or they may be handling uh, particular features. And um, notable examples of such engagements are uh, Bethesda working with Obsidian to create Fallout New Vegas or EM Mobile working with Byte games uh, to create Simpsons Tapped Out, and last but not least, Ubisoft working with Nival Interactive to create Heroes of Might and Magic 5. Another type of external development is co-development, that is using an external partner to extend an existing studio's capacity. Um, or to handle specific tasks outside of the main studio's key specialization, um, such as Blizzard or working with Iron Galaxy to create a switch port of Overwatch. So Blizzard created Overwatch, Iron Galaxy um, created um, a port of that game. You know, respecting, obviously, the original creative vision um, of their partner, but obviously adding the, the switch specific elements. And another example of code development could be Capcom working with Streamline Studios to create design and art uh, for Street Fighter. So basically extended their, their team in order to um, either increase development velocity or just add additional content to, uh, to their game. Um, and a very widely used form of external development is what we call studio services. You're basically sourcing capacity for a single discipline. Um, the difference between this and, and co-development is co-development usually is an engagement that uh, covers 
multiple disciplines. Whereas for studio services, you tend to go to a specialized vendor for um, a single game development discipline or you know, a, certainly a focused approach uh, in order to create um, a, a particular game. So an example of that would be um, the on The Last of Us uh, team working with Virtuous for art and animation and Lady Luck Digital Media. In, in that case, they chose two different art vendors to create one title. Another example is CD Projekt Red working with Testronic lab Laboratories for QA and with AMC Pixel Factory for art and animation. Again, they brought um, um, the benefits of, of this external collaboration to add uh, additional capacity to their studio. And last but not least, been probably the most, well, let's say, the newest form <laughs> of external development, and certainly the one that is most relevant for these uh, times of pandemic, uh, is the is remote development. Uh, you know, by uh, the force of the quarantine policies deployed around the world, a lot of studios and a lot of um, you know companies in the game space have had to learn fast how to operate remotely. And, um, but you know, this is not something that uh, you know, we just uh, started perfecting now. There are certain studios that have been working in this model uh, for a long time. And, um, and one of these um, uh, studios is, uh, is Moon Studios. Um, they built a game called Ori and the Wheel of Wisps using a uh, network of freelancers, so 80 people uh, working from home um, building that game. Or Metamoki. Metamoki is a virtual studio from inception. They don't have an office. They just have a, a, a network of collaborators. Uh, they're nominally based in San Francisco, but they all work from home. Um, and they use resources around the world to create their games. And um, so those are the general um, types of external development. I think it's useful to, to keep those in mind. Uh, each of them are different and carry uh, some unique learnings, which you will glean from the upcoming um, case studies that I will share with you. So um, the first story relates to basically going live unprepared. And that's a story that involves EA and Byte Games. Um, uh, EA's mobile, EA Mobile's Los Angeles office, you know, uh, back in 2007, I believe, um, was working exclusively with external uh, developers. Um, and uh, Byte Games um, was a team that EA Mobile had contracted. Um, they've developed Trade Nations and NBA Jam in the past, so they were a reputable developer. At the time, um, EA was also engaged in a wholesale transition to the free-to-play model. This was emerging as the dominant model on mobile. So they were learning uh, quite a few things about how to operate in that, um, in, on, in that environment, you know, with that business model. Um, so the game um, was faithful to the Simpsons franchise. You know, it was a complex free-to-play game that uh, was located into a virtual spring field. It was a city-building game. Um, EA released Simpsons tapped out on uh, mobile devices in 2012. Um, it had a five-day soft launch, which is incredibly short. Um, and the game, once launched, uh, quickly went to number one. Obviously, it's the uh, there was hunger in the market for a Simpsons brand and mobile game that the franchise is um, obviously very powerful, but it also received uh, tons of featuring in the App Store. Um, so, you know, the, the users loved uh, the premise of the game. They wanted to play the game. However, the back end buckled under the volume of incoming users. It basically crashed. Um, there were some... Um, uh, very challenging problems with the architecture, um, uh, with the way that the database structure was designed. 
And as a result, the game was removed uh, from the App Store in 2012. You know, the users would be getting all of these errors upon starting the game. So EA was forced to pull down that title. And um, the aftermath of that engagement was that EA, LA, and indeed EA Corporate knew they had a massive hit on their hands. And it was extremely frustrating because you know millions of users were dissatisfied with the experience. And they had to fix this fast. Uh, so they um, assembled a so-called tiger team to come down and, uh, and fix this issue. Um, they uh, were able to migrate back-end responsibilities to a more competent team in Ontario. Um, and uh, over the next six months, rebuilt uh, the back-end infrastructure for the title. The, the, the game went live again in August uh, 2012, and uh, it proved to be a massive success for EA. Um, it also resulted in EA purchasing Byte. Uh, the game made more than $350 million um, lifetime. So in the end, it was a you know, positive, it was a happy ending. Uh, however, um, it was very frustrating for everyone involved uh, to have to delay the launch by six months and to you know, effectively look bad to, to Simpsons fans the world over uh, in the initial launch. So what were the lessons learned? Um, I mean, there's an obvious and fairly technical one, which is um, free-to-play games uh, have a complex backend and they require uh, a lot of testing uh, in scaling in a live environment. But that's not really the main thing that I would like us to learn from this case study. It's really about a system where the publishers are owning the service and the backend uh, technology <clears throat> in live ops isn't the best idea. Um, you know, we uh, have learned the hard way, and, and this is a case study that proves it, that um, the studio that is developing the game should be owning their own technology and should be building it from the ground up and should be testing it and should ensure that the game behaves well in real life conditions. Um, and, and, you know, truly the overarching lesson out of this uh, experience is that the dev team must be empowered to run autonomously. Um, I cannot stress this enough. And it's um, uh, every time um, you're taking some from their ability to control their destiny, like relying heavily on central tech, um, uh, you are actually creating additional risk. And that has been our experience. And would strongly recommend that we uh, um, empower autonomous teams. Cool. The second story um, of external development relates to migrating capacity. So back in 2008, EA partnered with, um, well, EA conducted a review of um, large test providers across, across the industry and selected Globant um, an organization in Argentina to be um, a large-scale QA provider for their needs, and um, you know I was on you know heavily involved in in that process myself. Um, we obtained a very good deal from Globant uh, to scale an operation next to Buenos Aires in a city called La Plata, and uh, we uh, aimed to scale fast. Uh, to a record number of 300 people within that location in order to cover the requirements of this very large publisher. Um, so within a year of that happening, actually the process was going pretty well from, from a scaling perspective. Um, obviously there's a challenge when you have to hire so many people this fast, um, but we were able to control that fairly well. Um, however, at some point, economic turbulence hit Argentina. As you know, they regularly go through some uh, level of turmoil. And um, there were some things happening. First of all, uh, the government increased taxation, the dollar weakened. Basically, the um, economics uh, of the market were no longer supporting the rate that uh, Globant had offered EA. So a negotiation ensued. Uh, EA okayed uh, rate increase, not as much as Globant 
was hoping for. And really the aftermath was that it didn't make an economic sense for, for the partner to continue supporting that business. And you know, they gradually let the deal go. We understood this, you know, took the capacity back, redistributed to other uh, vendors. Um, and uh, even though Globe and NEA continued to have a <laughs> healthy relationship for many years, it was in other areas, not, not testing. Uh, it was mostly engineering related. So um, what we learned from this, you know, it's super important when you work with external partners that they feel they're getting a good deal. Um, and if they don't, you know, that, um, you know, despite best intentions, the deal will fall through. Uh, they may decide to, to move away from the relationship. Um, so the revenue made by the partner has to be sustainable. Um, you know, sometimes with uh, the advantage of being a large buyer, like I was in the past working with EA, you can extract very competitive terms from, from the partner, but you also have to make sure that they can operate successfully within those margins. Because if they don't, um, the deal will not last. It, it may be something they move away from um, on a reasonable time timeline. Cool. So third story. Uh, this is overcoming distance. It actually involves Amber, our agency. Um, Kixi needed additional development resources to finalize production on their game War Commander Rogue Assault. Um, we were and still are uh, uh, Unity development specialists, uh, among other engines. So at the, at the time, Kixi was very well versed in making web games, so they didn't understand mobile and Unity um, as well as they wanted to. So they felt the need of onboarding a partner to help out. Um, so initially, they hired us to basically create a port from iOS to Android. But, uh, <laughs> um, obviously, that's a fairly straightforward. Uh, engagement, but it rapidly evolved to code development, where we were asked to to actually develop a slew of features in the, in, in their game. So, you know, the time zone was uh, initially seen as a major hurdle to overcome, um, and I think this picture is trying to explain this. Uh, this is showing Pacific uh, Standard Time hours, and effectively, Bucure, the Bucharest team would come online around 2 a.m. and work until um yeah, 12 um and uh in in uh, psd and then the san francisco team of course you know would start around nine and work until seven six or seven um which afforded the the teams overlap between largely between uh eight and twelve um and initially, that was seen a challenge. It turned out to be an advantage. Why? Um, the teams were able to um, uh, work together um, in sequential fashion. So, you know, uh, the US organization would transfer instructions for work to the uh, Bucharest group. The Bucharest group would effectively work overnight and will deliver results in the morning for the US team to process. Um, we were organized in agile pods, uh, uh, enabling the teams to stay nimble and autonomous. Um, and we effectively reached a development flow that worked very efficiently across the duration of the project. Um, in, in essence, the time zone difference became a key asset. Uh, and the game was released in the market in December 2016 uh, to great user and critical reviews. And what did we learn here? Um, it, it almost sounds like a cliche, but it's very important for partners to work hard to build trust and respect. And if you do this, maybe risks can become opportunities. And uh, that was certainly the case there. We learned a lot, and it was a very good engagement. And the fourth story, uh, the last in my presentation, um, is about an unlikely success. So this is about a collaboration between Disney and Henera Games, uh, Spanish developers. Um, we formed uh, in 2012 a team called Disney Interactive Partners uh, to uh, work with external games, to external devs to make free-to-play games. 
Um, and one of the first games uh, the group made was Frozen Freefall. Um, it's worth noting that uh, because it was a new group, we didn't have a lot of, um, there wasn't a lot of confidence in, in the, the Disney organization, this external development model could work successfully. So we effectively were under fire to, to prove that it can be profitable to work in this uh, format. Um, and we secured Henera for the game, well, which was, you know, based on a on a new franchise from uh, the Disney Animation Studio. And we didn't have a lot of time. By the time by by the time we were able to secure um, all the details and the support uh, from the franchise within uh, Disney's organization, we found uh, ourselves with four months of development left. Um, because we were supposed to release at the same time as the movie. Um, and the initial forecast was $3 million. So <laughs> you know, due to the low forecast, actually, the game was nearly killed uh, at one point. And uh, myself and uh, executive producer on this title, Scott Humphreys, found ourselves on a, on a bench at some, uh, at some point, you know, talking about how our game um, might not survive. <laughs> um, and uh, that uh, story actually has a really happy ending. It was the game was released in December 2013 and quickly climbed the charts. <clears throat> it grossed uh, 75 million in the first year, and um, to the to to these days, the highest grossing mobile free-to-play game that Disney has ever published. So um, the codev model that we put in place there actually gave uh, Heroner a 50% rev share <coughs> with no investment from the Disney side. So effectively, they self-funded the development of the game. Um, and as you can imagine, um, both Disney and Henera made uh, quite, a, quite a great deal of profit from, from, from this title. Um, and this is a great story of indie game development uh, being successful. Um, so what we learned here is that you know it's worth taking some risks with the external developer, and sometimes working with a network of external studios can uh, allow you to distribute that risk um, and uh, bring more product to market. Um, but also, if managed correctly, these external studios can create a top grossing product. Um, so it's not uh, so it's worthwhile to complement your internal studio strategy with an external. Um, outreach and um, kind of development effort. So here's a summary of what we've heard so far. I hope this was instructive and um, it's important to remember these five things. Um, when you're set up, uh, when you're setting up um, an external development relationship, you must have a well structured operational framework that um, relates to number two that allows these external teams to run autonomously. You, it's very important to pursue win-win deals that enable the external partners to be profitable and to have their costs covered. Um, it's also important to invest in creating trust and respect between partners. And sometimes the senior partner has to make the greatest effort in, uh, in doing so. And ultimately, the, the fifth lesson is that it can be extremely lucrative to be able to perfect this system of external development. It allows you to extend your capacity, uh, at times tap into knowledge pools that uh, you may not have available internally, and ultimately uh, create very successful products. So I hope this, is, uh, this was useful for you. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, I look uh, forward to your questions. Cheers.